Welcome to a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews, where we will be taking a deep dive into the role of journalism in municipal government. Local journalism has always been an essential service to keeping our communities informed and holding our elected officials accountable, but never has it been more critical than in these challenging times. Joining us today are four esteemed guests who have spent their careers reporting on municipal government and have a wealth of insights to share with us. Ben Perlo is the former editor and a former journalist. Tim Kalinowski is a reporter with Airdrie City View and the Rocky View Weekly. Lauren Heinz is a reporter from the Okotoks, Calgary area, and Josh Thomas is editor of the Spruce Grove Examiner and Stony Plain Reporter. Together, we'll explore the crucial role that journalists play in ensuring that our local governments are transparent, accountable, and responsive to the needs of their communities. We will also examine the unique challenges and opportunities that local journalists face in the digital age and discuss the ethical considerations that all reporters must keep in mind when covering municipal politics. So whether you're a journalist, a government official, or simply someone who cares about their community, join us for a thought-provoking discussion about the essential role that journalism plays in keeping our democracy strong and our communities informed. So let's get started. So I want to start with the the overarching question, and I'm going to start with Tim because he was the first one to jump into the Zoom call here, <laughs> and then we're going to go in the order that people joined the Zoom call. So Tim, for you, what is it like to cover municipal council and municipal government in 2023? Well, I always find it very interesting to cover it myself, but you've got to be somebody who can sit through a lot of uh, uh, of long-winded uh, discussions and, and finite details to kind of sift through that to get to sort of the nuggets that you need to put in a news story. And I think uh, that's really the most important thing you can do as a city uh, or a municipal reporter is have that ability to sift the information to really kind of try to focus in on those things that you know of are interest to yourself. So that helps, but also potentially of interest to your, uh, your readership. So I think that's how I would summarize it. So it can be a good experience. But at the same time, uh, you're right. There, it's sort of an uphill battle sometimes to get people to pay attention to things that, even though they're very important to them, uh, don't necessarily catch their attention as well as some other flashier things that they might see on social media, et cetera. Josh, what about yourself? What is it like to cover City Hall for two different uh, organizations while still under the same umbrella? Three. Well, oh. sorry, it's it's two different two different organizations under the same umbrella, but three different councils. Um, it's challenging, I would say, but it's it's depending. It depends on your region. It depends on your situation, and it it depends on on the paper. Um, but I would definitely say, like, as a as a general statement, the, the industry, the print industry is transitioning. And so navigating that transition and, and kind of trying to get content out as fast as people want to um, take it in, while also, um, you know, trying to focus on that print product and like more specifically, the municipal council and being able to hone in on that municipal council. I think it kind of depends on your situation and how much time you have to um, devote to council. But I think just with everything all encompassing, it's, it's, it, the, the word is, is challenging. It's challenging to get it right. And um, that's, that's kind of what we're, we're tasked with. Lauren, for yourself, you, you're relatively the, the, the new reporter on the block in this round table. So for you, what's the experience been like to cover municipal politics in Okotoks? And how do you see it changing since you first started compared to where we are now? Yeah, so uh, I definitely agree with uh, Tim in that you have to uh, kind of sift through a lot of information that maybe you wouldn't expect. Um, I always say you have to uh, be an expert or a sort of expert on lots of different topics while not necessarily understanding any of them at all. Um, having to uh, kind of 
come to terms with what the municipal government act means and what bylaws mean and kind of all of this um you know this jargon that maybe the average person wouldn't understand and trying to digest it digest it not just for your for your own understanding so that you can write it but so that the people that are reading can also understand it um i started covering municipal politics in an interesting time i would say um before i was uh contracted to work in Okotoks, I actually interned um, in Airdrie and Rocky View where Tim works now. So uh, they were under the same uh, company, different areas, but with lots in common. And having joined kind of in the middle of 2021, it was very, um, it was, it was an odd time. It wasn't as perhaps chaotic or, um, there wasn't as much uncertainty as 2020, but it almost felt like there was more uncertainty because no one knew where we were going to go from here, what the upward trajectory was. And this was also the, the time where you kind of started to see the, um, the uptake in misinformation, disinformation at like a wider level, but it really started to permeate into that local level where uh, people were, I guess, concerned that the issues that they have with, let's say, the federal government and COVID were starting to translate down to their more local governments and the frustration or the anger that they had. Um was being projected, I guess, at people that they felt maybe had more direct control over what was happening in their lives. And this was also um, the time of the municipal and federal election. So you also have um, uh, messaging uh, surrounding elections, platforms and stuff, but a lot of it was focused around COVID, personal freedom, personal rights, um, stuff that I didn't necessarily expect to kind of be thrown into, um, given that up until this point, it seemed that most of the frustration was directed to people at a higher level. And so you weren't seeing the translation to um, having to cover it for a local newspaper um, because it wasn't it wasn't as local, if that makes sense. It does. And now, Ben, for you, for someone who's been out of the uh, the journalism business for some time now and working with uh, governments, how do you see uh, the role of journalists change from when you were an editor reporter to now being on the flip side and working with municipalities to try and get some of these reporters to cover some of the stories that you're, they're, they're, they're wanting people to cover? Well, the, the, some of the things that have changed are, are some of the reasons that I left the industry, unfortunately. Um, it, it was a big shift between when I started and, and when I exited journalism. You know, when I started, and I was with the same company for for a bit over a decade, I guess. And it started as Bose, and then that was bought, bought out by Sun Media, and then that was bought out by Post Media. And every single time you go through that, your capacity is reduced, the number of reporters is, is cut, and, and you're still expected to do the same amount of work. Um as that happens, and you no longer have the luxury of one reporter being a dedicated uh, council reporter or local government reporter, you wind up in a situation where you can't expect reporters to be the expert of everything, and you know that their resources are constrained, and you know that their output is still demanding, and it, it becomes problematic for local government, where you know now there's all these external factors and. They're still trying to get the same amount of coverage or the same amount uh, of accurate information going out as before. Meanwhile, even though local government impacts people's lives more than any other uh, level of government, it's the one that people care to read about the least. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, Would you it all agree with that statement? Sorry, Ben. Would you all agree one, with that statement, Tim, Josh, Lauren? 1,000%. Yes. I was I was scared to come on here and like, and, and, and kind of... It, like make that point because i don't want it to seem like like as a group of journalists we're complaining like it's too hard to cover municipal council we want to and we love it but like he is absolutely hitting on every single point that i you know had i wanted to share i guess to this end um it's a hundred percent true you, you just you cannot um first of all expect with the reality and look like 
every company is kind of the same. The, the staffing situations are pretty similar everywhere, right? Like here in Spruce Grove, Stony Plain, again, not complaining. We have two reporters to cover the three communities, 130,000 people, three councils, two school boards, all of the sports, including an AJHL team and a junior B team and every other story you can possibly imagine, right? So we can each write 10 stories a week and I can do the editing and the pagination um, stuff and get everything done. And there's still 14 other stories that are like, you cover nothing and there's absolutely nothing in your newspaper. You know what I mean? And it's just like, that's just the nature of it we cannot possibly be everywhere. So that's, that's to one end. And then to the end where like people care more about provincial politics than they do municipal politics. Look, like I've, I've covered both. I've covered municipal politicians turn provincial politicians and like seen the stark difference. It municipal politicians get way more done. They affect your daily life way more. And honest, honestly, I've seen, I covered Spruce Grove Council for a long time just as a reporter, and I was really proud of the work I did on Spruce Grove Council. So as a reporter, there was only two times that council building was full. It was when marijuana was legalized and when conversion therapy was on um, on the docket for Spruce Grove. That was a big thing. Um, so they ended up banning conversion therapy Um in the community, just as kind of all the other communities in Alberta were doing the same thing, but there was a big debate on it and it was pretty full for that. But it was that one and marijuana being legalized. Other than that, major stuff. Oh, and also the city center redevelopment. Other than that, you know, there's one person who sits in council chambers every week and actually knows what's going on. And to- um, Is that the CAO? uh, no, that's uh, her. It's a it's a beautiful old lady named I can't remember her name, but she always says hi to me. And now I'm really feeling sad that I forget her name, so I can, can't <laughs> say it on air. But she's there every single week. Um, but that's it in Spruce Grove. You know what I mean? It's just one person in Parkland County. Same kind of thing. It's like it's it's empty. And um, I believe it's Lauren. If I'm if I'm wrong, um, pardon me. But to her point, it, it takes time to understand and digest counsel. Right. As a a reporter, but even as a person, if you want to understand what's going on in your municipality, you have to kind of sit in on a few council meetings to even really understand what's going on, because it happens fast. And, you know, before you know it, they're on to the next item and you have no idea what just really happened. I think it also depends on the issue that's being discussed. Um, when I was in Lethbridge, it was a very chaotic time uh, to be a reporter in Lethbridge, and that was from 2018 to 2021. And we had the massive debate around the uh, safe consumption site. Uh, we had uh, protesters and counter-protesters. We had people storming council uh, at that time who were very upset about the issue. Uh, Lethbridge is at a major ongoing uh, drug problem. And downtown is is really feeling the effects of that drug problem. And so uh, I think it really depends. Uh, there's not that much excitement generally in other jurisdictions, I would say. But in when, when I was in Lethbridge, there was certainly a lot of attention paid to council meetings at that time. There was a lot going on. And I think that's still true. If something were to happen in a major way that would, that, that, that really captures people's interest, I think mm. there would be uh, more pay, people paying attention to that issue. But as for everyday council meetings, as you say, as a, as a Josh has said, and Ben has said, um, you know, you don't have a lot of people that are, are regulars, as it were. Ben, let's go back to you because I apologize for interrupting there, but that it brought us onto a good tangent there. I want to mm-hmm. know, because you just posted something on LinkedIn, because you and I are, know each other outside of this roundtable, about the role media has in covering stories. Council will want to put the mayor in front of everything. And I'm kind of going to use your question that you posted on LinkedIn in this round table. So I'm, I'm acknowledging that I'm stealing a question from Ben here. How do you find yourself the reporters in the room here? And I'll start with Ben and how you see this should happen. How do you cover issues that are affecting your cities or your towns when you have policy that, The mayor's the only person who should be speaking for the community because you never always want to go to the same person because it gets dry from time to time. Why is it important, Ben, for for municipalities to go and allow directors or other council members to speak and for the reporters in the room 
Is it hard to get other people besides the mayor to speak on the record to you about issues that are facing your community? Ben, start. Um, yeah, so I'll touch on a couple of points. One is the, the inter-council piece. I always say, let the mayor speak on behalf of council, um, but let other councillors speak because they're still human beings who were elected. That said, it can get sticky pretty quickly. Um, you have to have a council that knows how to speak to, to media or, or how to speak with the public. We had one situation where uh, a council member during the pandemic tweeted something about anti-mask, anti-vaccine, anti-COVID. Um, and it was published as part of a national story that designated rural council members as, as you know, less pro-vaccine or pro-mask as than uh, urban council members. And it reflected terribly on the community. And so that's a situation in which that council member shouldn't have said anything. Um, but it does happen. Now, when it comes to directors, I think directors should always be allowed to talk to the media. And there are municipalities that have the policy that the mayor is our spokesperson and the mayor is the one that does the talking. The problem is the mayor is not the expert of everything. Um, the mayor knows what's going on with council. They can speak to council decisions. They can speak to uh, you know general vision and, and direction that the community is taking. They can speak to how great the community is, business development, that sort of stuff. But when you get into the weeds, the mayor only knows as much information as they're given. And so if you're talking about a specific development or, or uh, a budget line or something like that, the mayor doesn't actually know everything that they're talking about in that realm because that's not what they're meant to do. Their work is governance. Um, we always speak when we consult with, with local government about the importance of keeping council outside of operations, that role clarity. And so you can't really differentiate that that separation when you move into the media scape. Um, directors are the experts, that's why they exist. So let them talk about what they know. The, quote, the, mo the mayor can give a quote as well, but uh, if you're looking for the actual information and the context and the history, that's where directors really, that, that's what they bring to the table. Lauren, for yourself, covering uh, City Hall in Okotoks, and I know some of the councillors, so I'm just going to preface that here. Um, is it hard to get different angles on stories when you do have a figurehead like the mayor who may only be able to talk via policy on certain issues? Or do you feel comfortable asking other councillors or even the directors for comments on stories that are affecting municipalities? Mm -hmm. So I actually have uh, experiences on both end of the both ends of the spectrum. So um, while I cover Okotoks Council quite regularly, um, I also cover Foothills County Council, and those two entities are completely different in the way that they uh, handle media. So in Okotoks, for example. Um, they have always been very uh, great to deal with. Um, I have, uh, if if it's the mayor I want to speak to, they'll give me the mayor. If it's someone that I want to speak to about snow clearing, they'll give me the director of transportation. They'll give me the CAO. They are very, very good about giving me access to whoever they feel can answer my questions. Um, and I think that comes from having a good professional relationship, but also my, uh, I guess, explanation to them is if I can't understand this properly, how am I going to ensure that the people reading it are going to understand it properly? And if I'm getting information from someone who maybe doesn't have the whole story or the whole background, it doesn't, it doesn't help me or it does, and it doesn't help you either. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, Foothills County um, is a bit different because I uh, have to drive to go to their council meetings. So typically I watch them virtually. They also hold them every week for in excess of six to eight hours a day. And there's not always as much going on. Um, when I need to speak to someone from Foothills County, I'm in the situation where I'm given the reef. And uh, that's uh, is understandable. Like I totally get what the, where that justification comes from. Sometimes though, like I said, it does become difficult when um, their position isn't necessarily to be the expert on environment or development or whatever. And so the information that they're giving me, well, while it's well-informed and likely accurate, it maybe doesn't get into the nitty gritty as much as I would need just for my own background to accurately write the story. So I 
yeah, I've had experiences on both ends of the spectrum and it definitely obviously makes it easier and more accurate to work from someone whose expertise is the issue that you're talking about. Not to say that mayors or Reeves are not experts Mm -hmm. in that field, but when you're being their job, as you said, is governance. And so their background might not necessarily lend itself to give me all of those background details that I don't necessarily need for a quote, but I need the background information to be able to accurately reflect the information that surrounds the quote. Tim, for you, uh, you've covered uh, municipal government for some time now in many different locations. Yes. Um, and, and I know from covering municipal politics back in Ontario that when you cover municipal politics, you have to sometimes just talk to one person, whether it be the mayor, the reeve, the, uh, a director, or the CAO. But until an election comes around and then the election comes around and then everyone says, well, you haven't given me enough column inches in your paper and I want to give you a quote on every single issue that's been in front of council for the last four years. How do you balance that? Because they're they're looking at you as getting their voice out there and they don't want to be seen as someone who's not done anything for the last three years. And when an election comes around, then they start talking to the media. How do you see your role in balancing the needs of what the paper needs and what the uh, story needs with the wants of what a counselor needs or a mayor wants? Um, I think it's just a matter of uh, what the counselor needs or the mayor wants. It's a give and take is what I would say. Um, I think as have you ever run though, into that though? Have you ever run into the uh, like a counselor yeah. or mayor saying you haven't given me enough column inches this week? No, and- I, I, we've had mayors uh, say that we don't want to talk to you because that last story you did was uh, we didn't like that story, and it's hard to get them on the phone uh, after that. And that does happen from time to time. It doesn't happen very often, thankfully, but it does happen from time to time. Um, fortunately, I've had pretty good relationships with my municipal councils, and uh, I've never had a problem in asking experts in the, within the, the jurisdiction to step up, and they don't seem to have a problem talking to me either. In fact, they would rather do that a lot of the times so that they get it right, as opposed to having someone kind of, and the mayor doesn't want to be embarrassed, or the Reeve doesn't want to be embarrassed either for, for saying something that they don't quite fully understand. So I think if you want a, a political uh, situation where you know it's going to be politically charged, I think in that situation, you're only going to get your political representative, your mayor or your Reeve. But if it's an information piece that is general information that doesn't have any political uh, component to it that seems to be uh, negative towards anybody else in the organization, then they'll, I think they're generally happy to feel that. It's only when it, those, those kind of complex political questions come up that they don't want to answer those questions. They prefer the mayor or the Reeve to answer those questions. That's been my experience anyways. Josh, for yourself, covering three communities for two different mm-hmm. organizations, I can imagine balancing the needs and wants of different councillors and mayors in each of those communities is quite tricky, particularly in small town communities where you are the only source of news for some some of these uh, municipalities where what you write is what's going out because the landscape of radio, the landscape of television has completely changed and they're more worried about Mm -hmm. the bigger cities of Edmonton and Calgary. So for you, how do you balance the, what's you talked about those 14 stories that you wish you would have been able to print, but you couldn't because you didn't have enough space. How do you balance that? Um. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 tough, right? If you're talking about that that full balance of everything, um, you just kind of try and 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 get as much out as fast as you can, um, while still you know being a a human being. Um, but in terms of of counsel, I've never actually. It's interesting to hear the the points on on um, like foothills, um, um, or or Lethbridge there from Tim just because um I've never actually experienced anything like that every single council I've um kind of been a part of is very much uh like like the Okotoks council was described um councillors have just been very open um the mayor has been very open in all three communities just whoever you want to speak to at any time if you would like to get a hold of you know any councillor at any time their cell phones are available um and and i think like the point has been made a few times really the the directors the caos are the ones who have a lot of the the, 
the information that residents really want and need. Um, and that's where you're going to get a lot of your, your quotes from. But anytime I've ever needed to really talk to councillors or, or the mayors on any kind of um, issue, um, they've been very open. Uh, to your point, though, around election time, I've, I have experienced a couple of times. Um, once in a little bit of a weird situation in Bonneville, there was a um, a councillor who he was actually running a competitor news outlet. And uh, he... Um, at the time I was a reporter, so it was like really interesting to be a part of this because he was running a competitor news outlet, but he was also running for council. Um, he ended up being elected. And I remember our publisher was like really upset that he, um, <laughs> he was even able to kind of like advertise council stories on his news outlet, but that's, that's here or there. Either way, that, that's weird. But it was a weird situation where because of that, he felt that we were not quoting him at all in council stories which was actually untrue like if you we he called us out on that and we kind of showed him that there was a couple times where we did quote him from meetings uh, but he there was that isolated incident where he incident where he felt he was being singled out just kind of because of a weird competitive thing in the industry and then um towards our last municipal election i really shot myself in the foot and to your point of kind of trying to get everyone's everyone's thoughts into the paper um I, with everything I already have to cover and noting that I don't have a lot of space to do this with, I went and I tried to do a Q&A with every single candidate that was running in the election. And I tried to do just three questions and print them in full, their answers. And what I found was I filled my entire newspapers with Q&As and I did that for like a month and a half and I still didn't get to all of the um, candidates and and some of the candidates were like, yeah, like this really unfairly represented us and like we didn't get to have our say. And I ended up feeling really bad about, you know, something I meant to to be um, kind of more informative on your, you know, municipal election and kind of a way to get all of the candidates um, involved. And while everything kind of went online, they were like, yeah, well, our community is largely, um, we have a large seniors community, you know what I mean? That's not always online. And so... Um, I have run into that situation where, you know, candidates or counselors are looking for more um, coverage around election time. And um, I think as kind of always, you just you do what you can. You balance, you know, making sure that you're fair with your coverage and, and getting uh, getting things out on a first come, first serve basis, but also making sure you're not letting other stuff that is important go by the wayside. And that's that's the that's the juggling act that that we do. So this transitions into the big question, and this is about ethics. You as journalists cover municipal governments from across Alberta. And now yeah. I have seen the relationship between council and journalists for our firsthand and from the administration side of municipal governments. You will know the mayor's first name. You will be buddies, buddies with them. When you walk in, they'll chat with you. They'll want to chat with you. But you have to go and write stories on these people who may be doing something wrong, might be doing something bad, might be doing something that might cause some controversy in the community. How do you see yourself balancing that ethical line of being friendly with your politicians, but also being critical when need be? And I know that's a loaded question because you all want to be friends with your uh, local elected leaders. But as journalists, you always probably have heard you're being too friendly with the uh, politicians. You're not going after them hard enough. So how do you balance the ethical boundaries that is reporting on people that you talk to and potentially even go out for a beer or go grab a coffee with from time to time? Who wants to take that one first? Uh, well, well. I ben, let's here. go. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm not actually doing it anymore. It makes it a little bit easier for me to talk to. Um, I I always just looked at it as an issue of professionalism. So I, I stayed friendly in the sense that we needed a working relationship. And uh, and my goal was always to put the the right stories out and the correct information and be critical when need be and, and don't when, when you don't need to be. Now, there was some times where I was probably too critical and others where I, I wasn't critical enough. And at both ends of the spectrum, I would get accused of, you know, oh, you're too friendly with them, or uh, you're just out to get them. And I, sometimes I would get both criticisms in the span of a week. 
Um, and so there, there's no real right or wrong answer as long as you're you're trying your best to be ethical, I think. Now, we had situations where um, I was unfortunately brought in to, to come down on somebody. There was a, an editor who accepted a gift from a mayor that wasn't appropriate, um, and they should have known that. And so then it was my job to to kind of go in and, and fix that situation. That's not the norm. Most reporters and editors understand where that line is. Um, and I think in my however many too long years uh, in media, uh, I had one council member get mad at me one time, uh, twice, sorry. One was they were upset that a story got out, which is not my fault. Um, they they were more mad at the situation than at me. Uh, the other, and their parents' business pulled advertising from the paper as a result. It is what it is. Um, the other side of it was I did have one person who came in and said, I thought we were friends. And then I had to very clearly state we are never friends. Um, but, you know, maintaining professionalism is all it really comes down to. Tim, you talked about your time in Lethbridge and how a Reeve just or a counselor wouldn't talk to you, would not yes. discuss anything because you wrote a critical story. How do you overcome that? Because the next council meeting, you may need a comment from them. So is it just a cooling off period for the politician to sort of wait? Or how do you see yourself trying to come back to that uh, relationship where a journalist can ask the questions, even though being critical of a politician in a story? And I don't mean critical as in you have a bias, but critical as in you're writing what they've said. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of... You have a job to do and they have a job to do. And I think you can be friendly without being necessarily friends. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, they know you have a job to do and you know they have a job to do. You know what their job is, which is to spin a message or get their agenda out there or introduce, you know, pump up something in the community that they think is important. And you, when you're, those events happen, you're there for them. And so they appreciate that. But then on the other hand, they also understand that if something comes up as a negative, they should be willing to, to be and open to be to talk to you about that. So I think it's like in my case, I always telegraph my punches. Do you know what I mean? I'm never gonna get, get I'm never gonna try to sandbag them with anything. I'm gonna actually say, like, we got this criticism that's come in, and there's a lot of people in the community that are concerned about this. And I just really wanted you to address it. And uh, it's then they know it's not coming from me personally, it's coming from a concern which has been. Uh, or debate which has been going on in the community and other, other voices have said these things. So essentially that's how I approach it. I'm never going to try and sandbag them, uh, but they know that I have a job to do. So when I ask that question, I expect an answer. And 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 to be fair, like 99% of the time in my career, uh, they've, they've, they've respected that. Uh, and uh, like I said, it's just been a few occasions where they have been a little upset about a story for a bit, uh, or, you know, maybe we've had to reevaluate the relationship a bit, but it doesn't happen all that often. But I would say um, the key is, is that, um, is that idea that we understand what the relationship and the boundary is there. Josh, with the rise of online streaming of uh, municipal uh, council meetings, is it easier to um, quote politicians now and them not being able to call out a misquote because you can literally say we can go to the tape? I mean, yes and no. If if you're a if you're a good reporter who checks his boxes, I mean, prior to the online world and even kind of during the pandemic, I was instructing my reporters like when, you know, when this thing opens back up, when we open back up, I'd rather you be in council. And they're like, why? Why can't we just watch it from home? I'm like, well, A, there could be a presentation. B, you know what I mean? Like Ben Scrivens has shown up at council randomly just on the agenda. And then it's like, oh, we have an Olympic gold medalist here. You want to get that photograph or have, you know, that sent in from council. We'd rather have, have you there and have that photograph and it's just more authentic if you're in person and actually paying attention than if you're at home and you have you know the Oilers game on silent in the background and and you're listening to counsel right so it's it's I always kind of wanted to have reporters there and if you had reporters there they should have their recorder going and always have that tape anyway right and and um Unless you're in a courtroom and you can't record, you should be always having that tape recorder going because that's your kind of like your, your that's your lifeblood, that's your bread and butter that gets you out of any type of situation because you know the truth is always your defense. Um, so yeah, I think 
you like reporters should always be at council meetings recording you know what um counselors say when they can and so maybe it makes it a little easier in terms of ease of access you can always get to council no matter what you can maybe kind of tune into two different councils at once for example if you know one important agenda item is on is gone going in stony plain well um, they're on a break in Spruce Grove or something like that. So it does kind of make it easier for in terms of ease of access. But um, at the end of the day, if you if you were a diligent reporter prior and you were in person and um, you were able to get those quotes. Lauren, what about yourself? Because I know Foothills County and Okotoks are pretty far apart. While they're relatively close, you can't really drop it, uh, the di- drop everything and run out to Foothills for mm-hmm. that photo. And I'm not trying to throw Josh under the bus here, but it, mm-hmm. it's a balancing act where you kind of have to do both best of both worlds here of trying to get out to all of them, but knowing that you're as a small uh, pool of reporters in your office, you can't get to everything. Yeah, for sure. And on that point, I would somewhat respectfully disagree with Josh. Um, I love it. it I love round tables where people disagree (laughs) with each other. (laughs) Well, um, when when you're in a situation where you have, especially in in a in a situation where you have a print publication, two days of every week, for the most part, your editor and your assistant editor, um, of which I was neither, are caught up doing something. Are doing pagination that kind of thing right Mm -hmm. um one of those days where we're doing pagination also happens to be um okotoks council days now this is that's a little bit different because i can walk across the street if i'm watching it on the video and there's something that comes up but i'm also in a situation where i don't have a work cell phone i only have like a, a landline so for example like this is a very extreme example but someone they find a body or if we were in the spring of last year there was a house on fire because we had seven house fires last year there's ha- being able to readily access to jump to things that might precede council um in that moment in time was really important to me and so for me the recording is almost essential um not only to look back on if I need to refer to something, but also because it's not always realistic that I'm going to be able to sit and watch it at that specific moment in time, there might be something that is more pressing. In terms of Foothills County, their approach to running council meetings is a little bit different. So they have an agenda um, that they don't necessarily follow in order. So they will have, let's say they do a lot of um, like redevelopment hearings, people that want to build something on their property, et cetera. And those are, those are usually set for certain times. So those for the most part are the only things that happen at a specific time in the agenda. Um, the rest is kind of, we'll do it when and where we have time for it. So if there's a particular item that I'm interested in and it's third on the agenda, even though they start at 9 a.m., it might not happen until two o'clock or or later in the day. So for me to go out there and wait is not an effective use of my time, regardless of whether or not I get an original photo or a supplied photo. When you don't have a lot of time and you're juggling a lot of plates, going and sitting and being in a specific place that takes me away from where my core coverage area is for the most part is just not realistic. I, I, I think it's a great point in terms of like the, the breaking news. Cause like, there's always, I, I can remember even like, I can remember even ridiculous times, like leaving my recorder on at council and having to run out to other stuff and, and like hoping I was going to get back, you know, to council in time before city hall was locked. So I think, that is definitely, um, definitely a great point. Um, the nine a.m. to two a.m. thing—I I get that, and like I understand that there are more effective uses of times. I, I don't know if it's just the the publications I've been with, but like just with the publications I've been with, if council's kind of going on at that time, that's unless there is breaking news, that's the most pressing thing at the moment and kind of getting whatever you can from that. But I also understand too, that a meeting that goes from nine to two, there's not going to be seven or eight stories that you're going to get from it, right? You're likely going to pull two or three things and you have um, spent a lot of that time 
Um, a lot of the editors that I kind of worked under would have said, too bad, that's your job, right? So I, um, that's kind of uh, the the approach I took, at least in, in terms of like, I, I try to be um, live at council, but you're 1000% right in terms of the breaking news. And in, in terms of really, it is just easier to go back on the recordings and always have them to work on. Because I think that's something that whether you want to or not, I think everyone does at this point. I will not like sit here and say that I I have not, you know, gone back on council meetings after them and 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 written up reports from the recordings because I have one thousand percent done that. I did that this week. <laughs> so um I'd also say yeah. it depends on the kind of publication you're with, right? Um when I worked for daily newspapers in Medicine Hat and Lethbridge, we just didn't have time to go back the next day and wait for a recording. You had to get a story out the next day, the next day. So you had to have it done by five o'clock that afternoon. The recording wouldn't be up till the next day. So you would have to go to those meetings and sit there. Or if you kind of had an idea when that agenda item might come up, you might be able to time it to come a little bit later or whatever. Once you get your agenda, I leave. You maybe you can leave. But now that I'm with more with these weekly papers that I'm with again, it's a lot easier to do the recordings because then you can just go back and pull the actual spot in the discussion of the story that you're interested in and then mm -hmm. jump in and, and don't have to sit there through a four, six, eight hour meeting to get your one thing that you needed or two things that you needed. So I think it really depends on what kind of publication you're working with and uh, what they need in terms of deadlines. Really stupid question. I know I always get told there's no such thing as a stupid question, but I'm going to ask it right here, right now, to every single one of you. You've all read council packages. Sometimes you have to make magic out of those council packages <laughs> because there is going to be nothing on that council package that is, quote unquote, story worthy. How mm -hmm. do you work through that situation? And from Ben's perspective, what should municipalities do to ensure that their local journalists are covering some of these stories that may not seem newsworthy, but are important to municipalities? Ben, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I mean, council packages are meant for council. Um, they're not meant to be attractive to the media or to the public, <laughs> really. They're meant to, to give council the information they need in an incredibly formatted way so that council knows where to find exactly what they're looking for. Um, and because of that, they are very boring and very data-driven and, you know, the, the excess knows of it all. That said, as a reporter, my job was to distinguish amongst those items and say what's actually going to affect people. You know, if you're looking at building a $100 million facility... I don't care what development permits are being sought at council. The story is the $100 million and how that's going to impact people's lives. Um, and so that's really what it comes down to. Now, uh, a good communications person who has a relationship with the media should be smart enough to say, hey, you might want to keep an eye on this story, but their hands are often busy doing something else as well. So it's kind of on everybody to recognize uh, what needs to be said. Sometimes... The municipality doesn't necessarily want a story leaned into, um, you know, if council's going through a code of conduct discussion where somebody might have screwed up, they're not going to phone up their reporter and say, hey, keep an eye on this. Um, it's up to the reporter to identify that and then to to make the story out of it. But uh, a good reporter knows their community and knows their readers, so they'll find it. Is it hard to get things wrong? Because you may think this is going to be a big issue for, uh, oh, can you not hear me, Tim? I can hear you. I was just adjusting oh, my earpiece. Was okay, sorry. You, you have a certain amount of column inches every week that you have to deal with, and you only have a certain amount of stories that you can put in those column inches. Online reporting has changed the name of the game, but the traditional newspaper is still there. I like reading the traditional newspaper. And now you, uh, as editors, as reporters, are hoping that your stories will go in, but sometimes they may not, and they may just be online publications. How do you ensure that what goes in the newspaper and what goes on the website are the most pressing stories? Because you may think that it's the most pressing story, but two weeks later, an issue that you thought, oh, it's a non-issue, I'm not going to talk about it in the, this, week's, uh, this week's story columns, it could blow up and it could actually become an issue. Is it hard to make sure to you get everything right when reporting on council packages? and the issues that are facing the municipalities? Who wants to take that one? Wow, wow, wow. A I journalist guess I, who doesn't I, like to talk. Tim, let's I go. Can, well, I could take it, I guess. Um, um, 
in terms of the importance of the stories, it's always kind of a mystery <laughs> to me. Sometimes you, you, I think if they're clearly when you look at, if you have experience in journalism, uh, you know, in covering this politics, what are the most important stories are like a budget story, a, a story which is going to be a big infrastructure project, uh, a very uh, heated social debate. You always know those are going to be good for stories. But, you know, you put up a budget story sometimes that you think is pretty important and people don't click on it, you know, so uh, the, mm -hmm. when the websites don't show the clicks, whereas you see a, a story about a cinnamon bun being sold at a restaurant down the street. And that one gets, you know, you know, a massive amount of views. So I don't know if that's on the reporter, uh, though. I think as you get experience as a reporter, you, you have a better understanding of what's important on an agenda. Um, but uh, I think it's also the, it's the attention span of the reader and what they feel is important. And those things don't always coincide. And I, I guess I kind of have to take some comfort in the fact that at least I've told them what's going on. <laughs> you know, it's there for them to read. If they want to read it, uh, it's it's an important story in my opinion. Otherwise, I wouldn't be writing about it. Uh, but if they don't feel that way, I guess I can't really. Uh, you know, you could take a horse to water, but you, you can't make them drink. You know, uh, that's the old expression. Uh, but one thing I have found over the years, if you look at a council agenda and you see a lot of public feedback on like letters of opposition and things like that that are already on the ad agenda, then you know that's probably going to be a, 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 a story which you may not understand is a big story, but it obviously is very concerning to people if you got 100 people writing letters in opposition to it. So I think it's worth taking a look at it, even if you didn't think when you looked at the agenda at first that it was going to be a very big story. So that's that's the long and the short of it, in my opinion, I guess. And sometimes so, they evolve, too. Some, sometimes it changes over time. Um, I remember doing one council looked at a you know basic review of an animal control bylaw, and they said we don't want backyard chickens or backyard farm animals. And it seems like a routine, simple thing. You throw it in a, a small piece at the bottom of a page. And then suddenly a woman came forward mad that she would have to get rid of this pig that was part of her family for X amount of years and lived in her backyard and drove her neighbors crazy. Um, and there was petitions and people protesting this woman wants to keep her pig. And, you know, suddenly that's your story is it's a human interest piece now instead of a, a council motion. So it evolves too. The community will tell you what they want covered. Yeah. So I think it's like, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead and then I'll jump in and I'll ask Lauren this question, but go ahead, Josh. I was going to say, I think it really kind of builds off Lauren's initial point that the reporters really needs to know their counsel and have had the time to kind of parse through what everything means and, and, and looking at the agenda and how their current counsel operates and how they like to move. And I think the more time you spend with your counsel, the kind of better you get at really picking out those key pieces or key stories. And then, you know, you adapt if if a woman needs to keep her pig, like, you know, right? Like um, if something like that pops up, you adapt. And and from there, you kind of just get a sense of what the important stories are. But it, it is it is it hard? Absolutely. Like, and it is it is it easy to get it wrong? You know, absolutely. We're we're not perfect and there's there's always stuff that um you know we don't think is as important as it might be and then it, it turns out to be hugely important but as a general rule if it's got a dollar figure attached to it a, a, a big dollar figure at least it's important or if it has public interest right it's it's important how has social media changed the name of reporting in 2023 I see Facebook, I see Twitter, and people like to complain on Facebook and Twitter, and I'm not blowing anyone's, bursting anyone's bubble here, but social media is where a lot of people get their information today. The traditional media is not the norm of the social, the uh, engagement that it used to be in the early 2000s, even the late 1990s. How has social media changed the way you have reported? And how has the social media changed the way that you cover stories? Will you go to social media if you think an issue is big and see if it's big on the rants and raves discussion boards, the uh, Facebook uh, insert B word here uh, uh, boards? Because we all know that they exist in your communities. How much impact do they have on your day to day reporting of issues that are in front of municipal councils, but also issues that you bring to ask mayors and councillors and CAOs? Lauren? Yeah. So I think the biggest point with social media is access. Um, 
whether it be the public's access to you, the public's access to their government or your access to the public. Um, I, whether this is a good thing or not, have gotten several stories off of social media. Um, of course, they require, I guess, perhaps maybe a bit more fact checking and, and background than the average person or the average story, because this person isn't necessarily accredited. You don't know who they are. You don't know if this picture of them is real. You don't know. You don't know anything. Um, when it comes to gauging um, issues via social media, I really take it with a grain of salt because Social media really exposes, especially municipally, how, how uninformed people are when it comes to certain issues. Um, there have been, in, in my opinion, of course, um, there have been times where I've seen in Oak Tokes, for example, posts about a specific issue and um, people will, you know, get into arguments or disagreements about which is correct um, and someone will say, Hey, you know, actually like the wheel wrote a story about this, like three days ago, four days ago. Um, it's, it's all there for you. Um, and it just shows that kind of like what Tim said, you can bring, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. The information is out there, but sometimes people are more content, I guess, with being blissfully ignorant or, um, claiming that they don't know uh, information to be true or false. Um, another element, I guess, of course, of social media when it comes to access, uh, at, uh, the public's access to reporters um, is something I didn't really expect to face um, like so early in my career um, was a lot of like very hateful um, like messages, emails, phone calls, um, from the public just really upset and belligerent with stuff that I had written. And um, it actually resulted in we, for a period of time, actually turned off comments on all of our Facebook pages, similar to what I think the CBC in Calgary still does it. I think City News does it. Um, because we were actually getting threats and um, like very slanderous, racist, homophobic names directed at our reporters um, for writing about things like COVID or drag story times or, you know, those hot button issues that get people all like fired up um, and passionate uh, in a way that you wish they would get passionate about their municipal budget or things perhaps that uh, matter a little bit more. Um, so it's, I think it's a common thing to say. It has its good, good and, and it's, and the bad. Um, but you really just have to bring out your judgment, I think, in terms of what you're gonna take as factual just as like a, a normal person reading their news on social media, um, take what's mm -hmm. factual, what's not factual. And also, of course, um, with social media, people using social media to get news, um, that kind of just uh, lights a fire on you to get something out quicker. Because, for example, if it's a bigger news story, um, not necessarily in a smaller community, but for example, if there's a fire or a car accident or something, you know that you need to get that out faster um and per perhaps shorter and more concise than you would like because people need to know about it because it's going to show up at the top of their facebook feed as soon as you hit publish right Tim, what about yourself how has social media changed the way that you report on issues related to municipal governments or municipalities in general well i think what happens is, is as a as a as lauren said um Sometimes the, the issue starts on social media now. <laughs> it used to be, okay, you'd go to a, you, you, the story would come, you go to the meeting or whatever, and, and uh, you know, people would show up at the meeting and they might get upset about something and that's where the story started. But now sometimes, well, oftentimes the story starts way before that or after that uh, on social media. So you really have to have somebody with some uh, eyes uh, in your newsroom on that. Thankfully, our, our, my editor does that here. I don't have to worry about it so much, but his, our big part of his day is scanning social media and making sure that we're not missing something. So it's just the reality of the newsrooms today. We have to be aware of that social media component because sometimes that's where the stories begin uh, nowadays or maybe end sometimes as well. Josh, what about yourself? How has it changed the way that you work and also how you cover municipal governments? Oh, uh, social media. Social media is just the double-edged sword, isn't it, right? Like, I, I personally, I really don't like it, right? But it's essential and it's, you have to, you have to know how to use it and use it as a tool. 
Um, and it's a good tool, right, for journalists in terms of finding stories, in terms of breaking news. I'm, the other day, for example, there was uh, smoke coming from Stony Pine. And immediately I'm like, OK, let's go to the local chat. And sure enough, in the local chat, someone's got a picture of a grass fire. So I message them. And before I know it, I've got videos and pictures live from this grass fire that's spreading. And before the, you know, emergency services or who are on the way are there, we've got pictures up. So it's like it's and, and then when they get there, we've got pictures of them getting there and walking through the fields to the grass fire and from a bunch of different residents coming in. And, you know, while I'm on the phone going, Rudy get there and you know trying to get my reporter out there i've already got five or six or seven things on social on, on my facebook and my twitter page for the examiner and you know people can now follow along there so yeah it's absolutely an essential tool that's that's used every day um but it's also um there's a lot of stuff like lauren mentioned with vitriol coming towards reporters um there's also just there's it's a it's a multifaceted piece let's just put it that way but it, it's a tool if you know how to use it then you've probably seen the rise of disinformation on social media uh as a reporter you put out a story people will use that story to attack one side or another they may not have read the story they've not may not have even glanced at the story they saw the headline and they will use it the way that they want to and i i'm, I'm gonna ask ben the non-reporter in the, the room here this question if anyone else wants to answer it please jump in ben how how do reporters battle against disinformation when they're using and they as in the people the people posting on social media using reporters stories to attack other people with disinformation yeah i think it's a a big question that there's no real right answer to because we're still figuring it out. Um, you know, it's interesting you hear, well, social media is a great place to find stories and that's true. It's not the best place to have debates or, uh, or find opinions because it's an echo chamber. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if, if you're looking at a, a community rant and rave page, nine out of 10 of them are going to be rants and that's being generous. Um, people are, are angry these days. And so that's sort of where you have to take it all with a grain of salt and, you know, if a, a council member hears eight comments on Twitter, they can't let that really affect their decision making because it could be that it's just those eight people and three of them don't live in the community. Um, so we have to look at it a little bit more less emotionally these days. The the disinformation side is uh, it's wild, but people use it as a weapon, as you said. You know, um, we had uh, prominent conservatives putting out a couple of days ago that, hey, look, Twitter designated the CBC is government funded. And then the next morning, they're wielding a CBC story about Trudeau's vacation. Um, you can't have it both ways. And so really, if you want to be uh, objective about it, you just have to take a step back. But uh, we, we know that people don't like to do that. So then it's up to everybody to, to try and separate fact from fiction and and work together to say, hey, here's what's actually happening. Um, I'm going to just take a step back and let the rest of you answer while I take an important phone call. I'm sorry. No worries. Anyone else wants to jump in on that before I go to my last question here? No, no, no. Okay. So I'm jumping into my last question. And this is kind of a overarching question that has kind of to do with your views on your industry right now. What do you believe is the most, I want to make sure I read this right, the most underreported or overlooked issue when it comes to municipal government in or municipal politics in 2023. Josh, do you want to take that first? As you scratch your beard, or do you, Lauren, do you yeah. want to take that first? <laughs> As that first. Or, or Tim, <laughs> like, Tim, Tim seems like he, he, he has an answer geez. for this. <laughs> I don't know if I have an answer for that. In 2023, what's the most overlooked issue in municipal politics? Uh, like I would when say you the put most... out a story, do you like? Do you think this is going to be a big story, and then it's overlooked from the residents, from the reader? Like, what is the most overlooked oh. reporting? That's what I should have prefaced that. What's the mo most overlooked reporting issue that you think is going to be big, but just doesn't get the traction it deserves? Well, I, I, it depends on where you live, I think, and and what your your issues. So are for your area, area. yeah, for yeah, your for, area, for what is it? For I, where I live, uh, you know, particularly in Airdrie, Rocky View County, we have a lot of uh, subdivision and development going on right now. And there's a lot of 
and this is like this is an urbanizing area in the county. It's it's called the county, but it's more of a uh, it's more of a, a big glorified town, or or even getting on the cusp of being a city now. And everything is most of the money coming into the county is from new subdivisions, people that want to get out of Calgary, build a big expensive house in the countryside. And so a lot of the problems that we have yeah, in the county, the county are these uh, uh, the fact that there's these really big development pressures that are really driving a lot of county policy because the money is so good. But at the same time, the uh, it, it's leading to a lot of um, conflict between interests, between agriculture people in the area, between uh, different industries that want to set up things in the area, between people who just want to live in their house and the big house in the country and enjoy nature, or get away from people, uh, you know. And uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of conflicts that are driven in this area by the, by that by that the pressures on development. And the question becomes is how much all this agriculture land is being taken now for these new developments. And where do we sort of, where's the end of it all? I mean, is it just gonna become a big urban pavement from one end of the county to the other now? Or are we gonna actually make some steps to make sure that we are seriously preserving uh, these types of natural, natural areas and agricultural areas traditionally? So that's the most overlooked issue, I think, by far in my area. I don't know about other people's areas, but that's the one that's uh, the most overlooked issue by far in the Rocky View County. And in terms of Airdrie, it's always about the services. It's a big, it's a city, it doesn't have a hospital. So, I mean, how do you not have a hospital in a city of 40,000 people that the provincial government has not funded? How do you not have essential infrastructure uh, to, to to provide for that hospital? So those those kinds of questions are, Airdrie is a big town or is it a small city? I mean, those are the questions that are really, uh, you know, driving public debate here or should be driving public debate here, in my opinion. And what about yourself, Lauren? For someone who's relatively close to the Airdrie Rocky View area, what is the most overlooked issue when it comes to municipal governments, in your opinion? And what is the most uh, underreported from the standpoint of the reader who just won't care about the issue? I don't know. I mean, it's easy for me to give you all of the overreported, or maybe not overreported, but regularly reported issues because that's what gets that, that's what gets shoved in your face all the time right i i think perhaps somewhat similar to the end of tim's point um okotoks is also kind of in a similar situation for uh rocky view county um uh airdrie in that uh and i could i could be wrong but uh population wise okotoks qualifies or could be qualified as a city uh, under guidelines, um, but has persisted in and chosen to remain using uh, town as a designation, which um, really informs a lot of its policies. And it's, I don't think it's the policies that the policies and the actions and everything I think are uh, very often reported on, but perhaps the, um, maybe not so much the uh, logistical way or uh, the the naming of things and how that relates to overall policy development, if that makes sense. So, for example, they're big on small business. Um, uh, development has been a huge issue because you know, like we want to we want to stay small, yet people are, I guess, failing to recognize that the population is almost thirty thousand people. Um, so I think perhaps that connection is something that is being underreported. And I'm assuming at some point, um, council and administration and municipal government are going to have to deal with it because again, I'm not an expert, but I don't know if you can continue to grow a population up into the several tens of thousands and still call yourself a town. So I'm assuming there might be some turnover um, in there. I'm not going to be covering it anymore, but of course, keeping a close eye on it. And I think that's something that people might start to pay a little bit more attention to and perhaps generate a lot of emotion around because a lot of people uh, or a lot of people that I've spoken to or just express, of course, on social media that they move to Okotoks um, to get away from the big city. They like the smaller community feel. They like the amenities, but they don't like the congestion or the traffic. Um, without failing to recognize that perhaps that's where it's inevitably leading to. So I think that is going to become a bigger, more talked about and reported issue in the coming weeks, months, years. Josh, what about yourself? Um, 
I think overarchingly municipal government in general. Um, but <laughs> uh, and realistically, like that's 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 not. That, that, I'm not I'm not joking there, but um, I, I think just more specifically, uh, budget items and and the budget itself. Um, I think when you talk about the point of like municipal politics being what affects people's lives the most, um, you could lobby your entire lives for a provincial, you know, party and, and maybe move the needle a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, whereas if you get a group of people together and go to a council meeting, you can actually move the needle quite significantly in your own community. And and I guess to that point, like Spruce Grove has 30,000 people, Stony Plain, a little less than that, Parkland County. I, I think the overall... Um, the overall tri region has around 100 to 130,000 people. In the next 25 years, and I don't know where administration pulls this number from, this is Spruce Grove, City of Spruce Grove number, so don't flame me for it, but they expect that the region will grow to over a million people in the next 25 years, right? So that's a lot of growth. That's an extreme amount of growth. And again, I don't know where they get that number, but you can see in terms of Spruce Grove and how they're growing out, Spruce Grove has already been growing rapidly, right? And they are continuing to push out rapidly and develop rapidly. And so there are these multi-million dollar budgets that come down and, and we, we we cover and, you know, three or four people comment on, on Facebook and 700 people out of the 30,000 respond to in a survey. Um, you know, they really affect everything. In terms of what your downtown is going to look like, what your, um, you know, what, what your transit's going to look like, what your every what your every day is going to look like, and what amenities you're going to have around you, and and so I, I think it's just largely important to, you know, scrutinize those budgets and pay attention to those budget items because it it affects it affects things right it affects things like I said there was two huge issues. Um, that brought people to council and it was the legalization of marijuana and it was um, conversion therapy and it wasn't even the new arena complex for 72 million dollars that's being built and while it's been like it's been a hotly debated issue it was nowhere near the size of either of the other two issues and this has been like since 2009 they were looking to put ice in they had a facility ready to go for like 20 or 30 million dollars less with arguably more in it i'm probably going to get flamed for saying that but it's true um a few years ago and council shot it down because of price and then this time around um, they kind of went in a different direction included more in terms of the arts with the civic center and it's a building that costs 22 million dollars more because everything costs more the later you go right and even that like there was some scrutiny to that it was it it was widely debated at the time, but but there wasn't even as as much interest as I felt there could have been in that, and and that is a huge issue in our community. So just those big budget items in general, like it, it really, you can move the needle, right? It's not that like you don't have a say and you can't do anything to affect your community in terms of like if you want to have an effect and make a change, municipal politics is where you're going to make your your biggest impact. Ben, last word to you. What do you believe is the most underreported and overlooked issue when it comes to municipal governments, when it comes to reporters putting out information and people just not picking up on it? Well, I, I think those are two separate issues. I think municipal reporting puts out the information and people don't always pick up on it separately. Um, I, I think that the the public is grossly underinformed, and a lot of that is by choice. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing is going back to the money side of it, um, where that money is coming from. I, I think that local government has been used as a political football over the past decade or so, and uh, provincial and federal funding has come and gone way more than it should. There, there's no stability in how municipalities are funded these days, and it's caused a lot of problems, typically all the problems that fall back onto municipalities. And so if the if the province, for example, is changing, and this is just Alberta Municipal Sustainability Index funding, that has a major impact on municipalities. And it hasn't changed 2-3%. It's changed double figures percentage. Um, it, it's changed drastically, where municipalities that aren't massive to begin with are now missing out on hundreds of thousands of dollars of funding. 
And so you have a, a population that gets very, very mad because their tax rate went up X percent and they go, well, council's misspending our money and the municipality isn't acting efficiently um, when really they're trying to make up for other shortfalls that they didn't see coming and they were blindsided by. Uh, if the province cuts education funding and education has to go, taxes have to go up, that education tax is expressed through your municipal tax bill. And so it, it's a big problem that people aren't recognizing because it's coming from different orders of government and it's being filtered through municipal government. And so it's it's something that needs to be more broadly talked about. Um, I think the other piece that isn't necessarily media's fault, but it is the local resident's fault, is that people don't know what local government does. And so as much as media tries to put that out there, um, People don't really have a full understanding of what council does, what administration is allowed to do, and, and they'll get mad at things that have nothing to do with them and then vote them out whether they're doing a good job or not. And then you have constant turnover in councils, which just creates ongoing turbulence at the local level. Um, and finally, from an outsider, I hope that local coverage is given more prominence and that you know that there's something to be said for local support of local reporting. Um, it's a big fear of mine that a lot of newspapers have been shifted digitally to digital only. Um, it's a fear of mine that that newspapers are being shut down because once you lose that coverage, whether people are picking up on it or not, that coverage does keep certain things in line. Um, local reporting is that local watchdog. And uh, if we lose that, we're going to have a hell of a lot of problems that emerge from, from local government, whether it's intentional or not, that would have otherwise been caught. So if I can just throw that little personal campaign in there that uh, you, we need to do you something. certainly can, Ben, um, <laughs> him, Josh, Lauren, Ben, I want to thank you so much. I know I said an hour, we're about 10 minutes over that hour mark, but I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor to sit down with uh, uh, you and just talk about your industry and how you fit into the realm of telling the stories that municipalities need to tell. So thank you so much. Thank you so much to our guests for joining us on this special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your insights and perspectives were truly enlightening, and we appreciate you taking time to share them with us. To our viewers, thank you for tuning in and being part of this conversation. We hope that you've gained some valuable knowledge and understanding from our guests today. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button so that you can stay up to date on all our latest interviews and special episodes. We have some amazing guests lined up, and we can't wait to share their stories with you. Now, if you're able to, please consider backing the show as well to help us continue to grow and produce high-quality content. Every little bit helps, and we appreciate your support. A link to our Patreon account is in the show notes. Now, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for behind-the-scenes content, show updates, and so much more. And finally, as much as we love our phones and technology, let's remember to put them down and have real-life, in-person conversations with people in our lives today, even if it's just for five minutes. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on the Cross-Border Interviews. Remember, everyone, just Keep talking.